All right, let's get started today. Um, my name is Michael Matkin. I'm the executive director of Citrus and the Bannatine Institute here at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 14th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. Um, we, over those 14 years, we've hosted uh, an amazing lineup of technology innovators, but usually in person at Satarjadai Hall at UC Berkeley. Um, but we are uh, happy to be virtual so that you can all join us today from, from your, your living rooms and offices um, for this, the final talk of the spring 2023 series. Uh, if you enjoy what you hear today, we encourage you to check the Citrus website in early September uh, for the fall 2023 research exchange speaker lineup. So we'll have that up there uh, and we'll have many more uh, great talks. So uh, before we begin, I wanted to quickly highlight uh, another upcoming Citrus event. In uh, next week on March 2nd, we will be holding the Edge in Tech uh, Symposium, which is on the theme of smarter tech for a resilient future. And it's a, again, it's a virtual symposium, and it's going to be highlighting the experience uh, experiences of many experts who are using emerging emerging technologies to advance innovation for more sustainable infrastructure. So the registration link is there in the chat box. So I encourage you, there's still time to sign up and we hope to see you there next week. Um, so before we get started, just a few little uh, guidelines. Uh, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A box on Zoom. You should have a Q&A icon in your Zoom tool toolbar at the bottom. So just uh, include those in, in uh, the Q&A whenever you think of them. And uh, everyone else, if you thumbs up a question, that'll help bring it to the top of the Q&A window and ensure that it gets asked at the end when we will be uh, posing them all to, uh, to Ricardo. So um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Ricardo Sanfelice, Professor Ricardo Sanfelice. He is a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He received his MS and his PhD degrees in 20, uh, 2004 and 2007 from UC Santa Barbara. He is the recipient of the 2013 Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics or SIAM Control and Systems Theory Prize. He is a National Science Foundation Career Award winner, an Air Force Young Investigator Research Award winner, a 2010 IEEE Control Systems Magazine Outstanding Paper Award recipient, uh, also received the 2012 Star Higher Education Award, and the 2020 Hybrid Systems Computi uh, sorry, Computi Computation and Control Conference Test of Time Award. He is an associate editor for Automatica and a fellow of the IEEE. He also serves as director of the UC Santa Cruz Cyber Physical Systems Research Center. And most recently, uh, he has become the director of the Citrus Aviation Initiative uh, across all four Citrus campuses. His research interests uh, include modeling, stability, robust control, observer design, and simulation of nonlinear and hybrid systems with applications to robotics, power systems, aerospace, and biology. It's my great honor to welcome today, Ricardo Sanfelice. Thank you, Michael, and the whole Citrus Enterprise for inviting me to speak to you about something that I'm very passionate about and is something that I'm working on. And I want to share with you some of the questions I have, some of the opportunities that there might be there for us to work on, and also some of the initial ideas that we've been working on, and um, a very exciting project that just kicked off as well. Um, but as Michael said, my, my background is in control theory. I do a lot of mathematics related to dynamical systems that are not um, standard, they are hybrid. I'll mention what that really means, but I will not try to you know hijack your lunch with a lot of mathematics today. I'll be talking quite a bit about some of the Again, the key ideas that have been driven um, over the years as well, uh, industry and academia, and there are things that I do believe that we can probably come together to unravel this bottleneck uh, that we have on autonomy. Uh, let me just start by saying that 
not something rather new, but something important, which set the stage for what I want to present, which is that computing is prevalent. Uh, as you know, we are these days very, very um, much um, attached to systems that have computing capabilities. You know, you probably are very well versed with many of these, maybe even better than me. But we carry around uh, phones and watches and laptops and iPads and all sorts of gear that we like to give um, a lot of use and also solve some of the things that we probably do in a tedious manner, in a more automated manner. Um, now, these computing capabilities um, are you know, typically associated to sensors and changes in the environment. We call those actuators in, in my community, in control systems community. And we would like to typically know what to do with you know, the information we receive, let's say, to wash clothes or to more interestingly navigate uh, in a road with a uh, autonomous car or fly from point A to point B with an aerial vehicle. And this also expands to appliances and all sorts of things. So the idea is that you will have some sort of computer essentially in, in these systems and that computer will be able to, based on some intelligence, which is provided by algorithms that are designed for a particular purpose will actually solve some of these problems or, or again, automate some of these tasks for us or provide some sort of service. Now, the scale of computing or computational devices in these systems is growing very, very dramatically, as you probably know. And when, when we have that kind of capability of computing, maybe with low cost and high speed and with some tunable precision, we actually face the risk of overusing it and you know making the system more complex than it should be to a particular uh, goal. Uh, I'm not saying that this kind of system is unnecessarily complex right here, but as you can see right here, there are a large number of computing devices in a car these days. This is not necessarily the good old school mechanical system problem, but it's now more of an electromechanical and actually tilting towards more electronics and computing these days than into mechanics, because those are systems that are well understood and well designed and reliably uh, well done. Um, but essentially, and this is a nice uh, slide that I collected from online, and I really like because this is actually what happens now when we start using these devices more um, broadly and for all systems that we could ever dream of, then we end up with a computer that is on wheels. So when we drive in our car, um, most modern cars, 10, 15 years old, will be black and you know completely um, uh, instrumented with all sorts of gadgets and sensors and computing and actuators that solve many problems that are very, very nice. Uh, some of them are very important for safety, as you probably realize. Uh, braking is critical, relies on a lot of computing, uh, not only to keep the car safe, but also to um, make the, um, the brake systems last longer as well. Um, we also have this capability of more, more recent cars to have avoidance control and prevent uh, collisions from happening or uh, other kind of uh, accidents uh, in real time. Now, it is very important that we also have these systems for comfort, right? So, for instance, uh, pushing the button on your chair to lean back or change the temperature or even change the air on your car automatically. Uh, providing connectivity to different kind of services via internet is very, very something that we really pretty much take for granted these days. And uh, sometimes uh, I, I take trips uh, on, in my car with my family and then I kind of complain that there is no Wi-Fi, there is no 5G in that particular area. Yeah. It's amazing how much we pretty much, you know, uh, assume that this is uh, widespread and very useful. Now, um, Quick question as you have your lunch, perhaps, can you guess how many computers are in one of these cars these days, roughly? Any idea? You can type your answer in the chat. Two hundred twenty-two. All right. Good answer.
Well, it really depends on you know the brand and the technology being used. But most of the vehicles these days, based on conversations I had with the industry and reading about this, have at least 50 computers on board. Uh, that means that you need to have a way to connect them. So you have that working within the system. You also need a way to power them. And also, very, very importantly, you need to have software there that is not only reliable, but also it can be uh, updated. So that's, uh, again, uh, I don't own 50 computers myself, but if you have a car, then definitely you have them. Now, as you probably realize, as we make these systems more and more computing driven, um, then there is a, a cost associated to that. And this is uh, an article that comes from the Economist Writing Every Day uh, blog that says that electronics are responsible for actually rising the cost of a car significantly, as you see right here, as maybe 45% predicted by 2030. So even though we really appreciate, we really want that computing power and those capabilities, again, mainly I would say for safety and efficiency, but also for comfort, it is important to know that this is also creating a different kind of issue, which is the issue of cost, the issue of maintenance, the issue of keeping up this system in the right way, making perhaps our uh, car shops more like an IT service plus mechanics than just the, again, good old school mechanical kind of enterprise for cars. Now, as you probably know, and it's unfortunate when we abuse uh, of using technology and uh, computing, we can run into issues, right? And uh, this creates essentially safety issues. So certifications of systems have become more and more complex, more and more tedious. And um, the famous 737 aircraft, as you see right here, the copy, is one of those that is, is the most, I would say, uh, exciting and um, powerful and uh, adopted aircraft, uh, or one of the most, right? But it certainly has had issues in certification and in, in essentially trying to figure out what kind of computing sensors and physics will do the right thing for the particular uh, task. Now, uh, we have gone a long way in making computing more and more powerful over the years. And um, these days we can instrument these systems in a way that we can actually create a lot of computations in a very small amount of time. And that is great. And, and that's a very exciting direction. But again, the risk here is to uh, compromise safety by uh, changes in design and overuse perhaps of computing. Now, here's a little trivia question coming directly from adobe.com, which I really like, which compares uh, computers back in the days and computers today. And I really like this because it's actually comparing uh, an iPhone, a relatively new iPhone, iPhone 12. I own one of those actually. And the well-known Cray 2 supercomputer that was designed uh, for the United States Department of Defense and Energy for actually uh, a study and development of uh, nuclear weapons and oceanographic, oceanographic, oceanographic development, okay? So the question here is, how do these compare? Um, these are very interesting uh, questions, right? How much can we have been improved over the past uh, 50 years or so? Uh, so this is comparing the 1980 supercomputer that I just mentioned. So this is about 30 years ago uh, to the iPhone 12. And the, com the comparison is pretty, I think, accurate. So there is a, a quick um, change in, in weight, as you see right here. Uh, we have essentially a comparison of, you know, the number of pounds, 5,500 pounds of this supercomputer compared to the iPhone 12, which is less than six ounces. And if you were to actually try to make that supercomputer uh, have a similar kind of um, computing power as the iPhone right now, you will need to have this kind of a scale match in between the two systems, which is uh, significant, right? Now, in terms of computing power itself, uh, compared here, uh, not only to the um, Cray 2 computer, but also many, many years before the Apollo 11 guidance computer, we have gone from 12,000 flops to all the way to 11 trillion flops, where flops are floating point operations per second. So this is a massive increase and in a very small package. And again, 
makes us very powerful. But at the same time, we need to be careful about how do we um, distribute these systems? How do we solve the interconnection problem and software that power and as, as you know, a number of other things that are involved in this. Right? Now, in the context of using these computer systems in, in autonomy, which is the focus of this talk, it is important to realize that autonomy is, again, is a concept that comes from providing physical systems with computing power, sensors, actuators, in order to actually accomplish a particular task in an autonomous manner, in other words, without intervention from the human. Okay? Now, if you look at the literature of autonomy, and I would say it dates back to the initial you know, directions and um, progress on automation, which is based control systems, and that falls in the area of my expertise, is that if you look at where autonomy and computing goes, it is important to realize that the problems that I was just talking about uh, are very clear and concrete because they actually provide uh, a concrete, I would say, uh, uh, issue that needs to be solved, which is about how fast you can compute and at too much power, what kind of amount of power you need, energy in particular, to provide those computations. And then how resilient is that computation to perturbations, in other words, to noise, to changes in the environment? And if you look at the um, magazine that IEEE puts out uh, called Computer, uh, one of the recent issues talks about what are the challenges of computing for autonomy? And I invite you to, to look at this because this is actually where you know, the key issues are. And, and one of them is latency, which is again, is how long does it take for me to obtain a result from a computation? Because as I will explain in a diagram using basic concepts from control system in a few slides, essentially computing for autonomy means that I gather information from my environment and based on that environment and my specifications, I will decide essentially how to change the system to accomplish those specifications. And that change is obtained or that decision is being made via an algorithm. So we are at the end of the day trying to figure out how long it takes for an algorithm to be computed and to be to terminate, right? Now we are in 2023 and these problems, I would say with the power of computing that we have compared the Cray 2 to the iPhone 12, we are not even going to an industrial computer, which is massively more powerful than an iPhone 12. Uh, we will think, well, these problems are gone and solved, right? But it's actually not the case. Actually, you look at articles online, like for instance, this particular article, where um, companies are looking for new ways to actually compute faster, in particular using quantum computer, okay? And, and that also creates you know, a cost in power and energy being used to create the computation securely. And that actually creates, as I was mentioning earlier, a particular issue or potential issue with the global carbon footprint that these systems might create, right? So these are very, again, even though the technology is here and we can integrate it, these are problems that need to be solved, in my opinion, in a uh, unified, in a manner that, you know, both the computing, the algorithms, the hardware, the computer architecture experts come together and try to figure out, the power systems experts come together and figure out how to solve these problems. Okay? So the overall problem that I would like to tackle in the context of computing based on these uh, points that I made is the problem when we don't know necessarily how long it takes for a particular computation to terminate and how do we cope with that in what we call a autonomous type system, right? So on this chart that you see right here, we have the traditional feedback control loop where we have a physical system. This is the block on the top, which corresponds to the system we would like to control. That system has what we call inputs labeled as U and has outputs labeled as Y. Inputs are essentially the things that we can change. If we had a car, which I will mention later, we may be able to change the steering wheel, the brakes and the accelerator in particular. And the quantity Y are the quantities we can measure. So for instance, in the vehicle, it will be position, it will be orientation, another quantity is associated to motion, right? 
Now, a control algorithm in feedback, what it does is to sample that particular measurement, set of measurements, at, let's say a particular uh, rate periodically, capital T, and then uses that information to feed a computer that calculates essentially what should be the next value for the steering wheel, the accelerator and the brake, and so on. And that kind of structure is what we call sample data systems or sample and hold control. So there are samples of the measurements. There are updates based on the output of the algorithm that is being performing or evolving in the computing system. And then that creates the feedback loop. Now, what happens is that feedback is very good at giving robustness to perturbations. However, when computation is one of the perturbations, and that computation might take a while to be actually terminated, feedback might not be able to solve for that because that's a temporal kind of um, uh, lack of information. In other words, if your vehicle is moving forward and you don't have a new value of your steering wheel, it might not be the case that you might avoid an obstacle. You need to have a way to compute rather fast. So robustness might not go very far in that sense, okay? So that's kind of the challenge is what happens when what we have in the controller box that you have right there, which is again, an algorithm, we're gonna look at a couple of them. Uh, you don't know exactly how long it takes to compute. Okay? So that's the key question is how long does that algorithm take to compute, all right? So in order to look at some of the details and maybe a particular solution to the problem and then the opportunities, what I wanted to dive into is uh, the famous um, kind of, or to say textbook that I like when I teach um, control systems uh, written by uh, Franklin Powell and Imami Naini on feedback control of dynamic systems. So again, many of you probably have seen this or maybe it's the first exposure to this kind of concepts, but the idea is that you have a, a physical component, a physical system, like in this case, this aerial vehicle that you see right here, and you have a way to change its motion. In this case, it will be via the angular velocity on the propellers. And by changing that angular velocity on the propellers, then you can describe a particular motion. The question is, how do you change the angular velocity on the propellers based on information on where the vehicle might be, which comes from the sensors that define this signal Y, which is essentially, in this case, it could be GPS, it could be orientation, it could be acceleration, it could be rotational uh, um, acceleration as well, and velocity, and the such. So if you look at these kind of books, and, and this is, a, again, a linear systems mainly, there's a chapter about nonlinear, but um, basically linear systems control theory, what you're going to face is that you need to fit your system in the following paradigm. You have the system to control, which in this diagram is called the plant. Uh, that um, essentially has not only the physical process, in other words, the uh, equations of motion of this quarter in the previous slide, but also has the information about how the um, position and orientation and all these quantities change based on changes on actuators, in other words, in the quadrotor case will be the propeller, angular velocity, right? And um, the information that we receive, which is the output, I called that Y earlier, is information that comes through a sensor. And that sensor is actually uh, a device. It might be network. It might be another computer itself that sends information back to the computer that runs the algorithm. Now, the algorithm, which is the controller, is actually going to typically compare the output values relative to a particular desired reference. So um, a simple way to explain this, if, if you would like your quarter to follow a particular path on space, which is a 3D path, X, Y, and Z, then essentially what you would like is to make sure that the error between your desired path and the position associated to the quarter goes to zero. That means that you will be approaching that particular path as time evolves, right? So you compute the error quantity corresponding to this uh, reference minus output kind of um, uh, 
mismatch. And then based on that mismatch, you design a control signal that will actuate the, the physical. So there is a system to control, and then there is a control algorithm. And again, in a, in a book like the book by Franklin and co-authors, this is essentially a, a structure that corresponds to um, um, a mathematical abstraction. And then one needs to put some sort of uh, mathematical descriptions to all these objects and use mathematics to design this control algorithm. Okay. Now, uh, a particular concrete example would be the control of this small aircraft that you have right here. And one particular control now that you have for this aircraft are the moving surfaces, in particular, the elevator that you see right there on the screen. So as you change the elevator, you essentially can change the orientation of the, of the um, aircraft relative to the horizontal, the so-called pitch of the uh, aircraft. Okay? And the way what we proceed typically is to describe this system uh, as a mathematical expression that relates the elevator, in this case, input to, let's say, the angle that we call the pitch angle, which is in this in this um, um, model right here is described by theta. Now, this is what we call a continuous time model that is linear in the Laplace domain. And this is what we call a transfer function. We could also do this with a differential equation model. But in classical control, we use uh, frequency domain methods. And then what we do is to describe this transfer function in what we call the S plane, the Laplace plane. And then we try to figure out what to do inside the controller so that the entire interconnection of this system will have this transfer function change into a way that guarantees a particular specification. Uh, one key specification could be the amount of time that the aircraft takes from going from a particular altitude to a new altitude. Okay? That could be one of interest. And uh, once we design that controller, as you see right here, that's another transfer function in the Laplace domain. Then we can go into the algorithm itself. So in continuous time algorithm design, we actually process um, the, the, controller, the controller design all in continuous time. And then what we typically do uh, in order to understand how this will run on a computer is to discretize the control algorithm, okay? Now, some of you that may be more experts on control design might realize that, or might want to say that you can also discretize the system model to control instead of being on the S Laplace domain, you can go to the Z transfer domain and then work on the discrete time model and then design a controller for that. Now, if you're also familiar with hybrid systems, you could actually probably come up with a hybrid model of your system to control. And that's what we do in my research, and then try to come up with an algorithm that will control it. And the algorithm may also be hybrid. But for the um, purpose of simplicity, we may want just to consider the plant of the system being discretized or the control algorithm being discretized. And what happens now is that we end up with time that is slotted. So this is a snapshot from one of my favorite books when I teach this course on um, linear system theory, which we teach here to grad students in control and robotics and cyber physical systems, then you end up with a model of the system to control that is now given what we call a difference equation. This is pushing us into what we call the state space realm of models. And this state space model is a, a linear model because the uh, quantity X and U depend linearly. Uh, on the new value of the quantity x. We call that the state of the system and u is the input to the system. But having said that, there are a number of assumptions that we need to put into the system and a particular structure on the control algorithm. Without going into the details, we typically start with what we call proportional control. And, and with that, we can design this proportional gain, which is this capital K right here to accomplish a particular goal. Again, typical goals are uh, rise time, uh, settling time, overshoot for transition, robustness margins, and so on. But uh, in all my education in, in, you know, in, in control theory and in all the courses that we teach, the, the question about computing power and how long it takes the algorithm to, to terminate to compute in a real system does not really pop up because 
disk multiplication that you see right here, minus kx, is definitely not a big deal. I mean, we can compute that rather fast, and uh, unless we are very resource constrained. And there are some situations that that's the case. But you know, if you use an iPhone 12 to control your your car, then you will be fine doing those computations there. The question is, or the issue is, uh, or or the problem of computing emerges more importantly when one tries to embed optimization in the control loop. So now instead of thinking of a proportional control, or again, if you're familiar with control systems, maybe you're familiar with the proportional integral derivative control scheme. Instead of using those classical control schemes, maybe one would like to be able to exploit the power of computing and the capabilities of measuring and estimating disturbances and the necessity of overcoming parameter uncertainty in the system, and then run a, an optimization algorithm, right? It turns out that the proportional control scheme that I mentioned before is the solution to an optimization problem already. Why not take that to the next level and use ideas from maybe artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, model predictive control, which I will mention later as well in more detail, and, and solve the problem? Well. The catch there is that now what I'm doing, which is very interesting and prevalent, and again, very convenient, I would say, because now I can formulate what we call an optimization problem to determine the new value of my angular velocity for my propellers or my steering angle for my car and so on. Now I have an optimization problem to solve. And that optimization problem to solve might be, and here's an example, is a continuous time optimization problem over a finite horizon with state and input constraints, um, then and now I'm at the sake of how long it takes for this optimization problem to compute, <clears throat> which is a quite different setting than what I had before, where I had essentially uh, to compute a multiplication between, a, in general, a matrix and a vector, right? Which we can be quantified and one can figure out how long it takes, how many resources that is being used and so on. So that's the key issue, especially as we try to use more and more AI and ML. And as I said, model predictive control, which is in my opinion, a very good strategy to overcome and essentially prepare the system for a potential future issue down the road. And, but the question is, how do we characterize the amount of time it takes to compute, right? So another reason that um, computing in autonomy is becoming very, very important and understanding how to exploit it is very critical is that most systems is they have resources that are bounded and those resources might be used for many things, especially if the system is running a multitasking operative system. So the question is how do we allocate in real time all these resources such as, such as CPU, memory, cache and the such. So this needs to be done in a way that <clears throat> safety and performance and the properties that you would like your system to accomplish are not jeopardized, particularly safety, right? So now in your control scheme, you not only have you know, your design that maybe comes from a very nice theoretical tool, but also you need to figure out a way to put that into the computing system and determine how the resources will be allocated for the particular control task as time evolves and as needs might emerge and maybe changes in the system um, model or uh, changes of resources, okay? So it turns out that the resource allocation affects computation time because certainly you will take longer to compute certain operations when the resources are different, right? Especially if they are significantly different. So the question is, how do we figure that out? And we wrote a, a, a short position paper with my colleague Lin Fan at UPenn, where we look at ways that we can mitigate these computational constraints uh, using what we call adaptive control and uh, resource allocation in co-design. So there are a lot of opportunities here, I'd say, to do compositional co-design of not only the software, but also the hardware which will involve how do you co-design and how do you actually allocate resources in real time. And, and that requires protocols that will essentially coordinate these changes of modes that occur when tasks in the microcontroller get assigned 
um, to different processors, especially when you're looking at multi-core structures, which are very prevalent and require a lot of uh, clear and systematic design in order to not jeopardize again the properties that you would like to accomplish for your system. So these are questions that are very, very, in my opinion, at the top of the list of things. Um, I didn't mention that with my colleague, Matt Hale. We also wrote a position paper about challenges of optimization-based control. And um, there are a lot of, I would say, a lot of ways to do resource allocation for different problems and figure out ways that this will work. But there is no, uh, talking to my experts that I mentioned, not a unified and holistic way to design these systems. And it comes essentially as a case-by-case -case study. So one of the things that I would like to share, share with you is some work that we did with my colleague, and Jonathan Sprinkle at Vanderbilt University, which is again revisiting this question that I started earlier today, where we have um, a physical system controlled by a computer, where we sample and update the um, signals in, let's say, a periodic manner, if you will. But we have now the capability of uh, throttling the accuracy of our control actions. Okay, so our solution is based on the following. We can now change the accuracy of the models that we use. Remember, for that aircraft model that I show you, there was a transfer function model. Now we can model that in different manners. We can be a very, very detailed model, or it could be a very, very crude model. And then we will throttle between the models for using in optimization based on where the system is. Okay. So let me give you some examples here, and I will go back to a car problem, which I think is probably a good idea to illustrate things with. So as I said before, there will be um, state updates, so measurements that we take from the environment, we call that uh, state update, and then calculations of the new input. And the input will be, again, sent back to the actuators. In this case, it will be the gas pedal, the brake, and the steering wheel angle, and that will be arriving to the actual physical component once the computation terminates. Now, as the system evolves, this can probably be nicely and periodic, and I might have a new value of my control input pretty much every capital T seconds, which is my period of updating, but it might be that at some point in my run, either my resources were taken away or the conditions in the environment were looking a little complicated and my optimization scheme didn't give me a control input when I needed one at the last update here on the, on the screen on the right, right? And then I miss a deadline. So missing a deadline is a big deal, especially in autonomy. And um, what happens is that we would like to make sure that uh, we don't crash into obstacles in particular because safety is critical, right? So um, this idea of model predictive control is basically saying that you can actually predict forward in time with a model where your system might go. In the case of a vehicle, if I'm in this configuration, I may look forward in time. If I wanna go to the right, to the goal circle, I will be able to skip this obstacle by moving in a straight line. Now, if the obstacle moves a little bit, let's say it goes down or to the right of the vehicle, now you will have a, you know, a new trajectory that you would like to execute. That trajectory has a sequence of inputs, commands on the actuators that will execute this path, right? So we might wanna have a small margin of error for that. And um, we might not now um, be able to compute that with a very sophisticated model, sophisticated model of the vehicle. So one thing that we can do is to actually reduce the accuracy of the vehicle model and now compute much faster. Because again, think about a model that is two dimensions versus a model that is five dimensions. The computation cost is significant, right? Uh, it's different. And for the lower dimension, the computational cost of optimization problem would be much lower. But the catch is that now we might not be able to avoid the obstacle in reality. So we need to augment the margin and make things more conservative, which is not always what we want, right? So one way that we can solve this problem, and these are essentially due to the competing constraints, is that essentially a high accuracy model of my system, in this case, the vehicle takes longer to optimize, or a high um, vehicle um, 
a, high, a low low um, accuracy model can probably not predict all maneuvers very well, but some of them might be able to do that pretty well, right? Okay. So now, if I want to move the vehicle at high speed, then it might not be able to tolerate a slow return time as the uh, optimization scheme might have when the like, high accuracy mode is being used. Okay. So there is this again, this trade off between how accurate I want to compute my actions compared to how fast. So the solution that we came up with, uh, my colleague Jonathan Sprinkle, is based on the following idea. Um, if we can now um, use the time required to perform our computation as a constraint, and um, we have different models in our, let's say, bank of models for optimization available, then we can probably switch between the algorithms that we would have for each different model with different accuracy, and then decide which one to use according to where the system is in the state space. In other words, trading accuracy by computational power based on the needs of the system. There are some situations where you will need to slow down perhaps and really compute a high accuracy, especially when the vehicle is nearby a particular obstacle or another feature in the environment. So here is a situation where we have a, a car. This is the top view of the car. And we have two mathematical descriptions of this vehicle. I'm not going to get into the details of these because these are nonlinear models. But the vehicle on the top, as you see right there, has six equations on the right brackets. That means that it's a six-dimensional model, while the model in the middle of the screen corresponds to a three-dimensional model. That model is what we call a kinematic model. And the model on the top, we call it a dynamic model. It includes much more details of the system. Now, as I said earlier, I will have a real kind of uh, physical system that I can control using a model of the system for which I solve an optimization problem. Now, one way to do to control the system that way is using this idea of model predictive control. But at the end of the day, it's an optimization scheme that will use a model of a system. So what I can do is to use a model of a system that is, again, the kinematic model, for this uh, situation where Q is equal to zero and compute things very fast, or at least much faster than when I use the model for Q equal to one, because for Q equal to one, I have a higher dimensional model, okay? And then the question is, which one do I use? At what points in the state space, okay? And that's going to be determined using what we call a switching logic that is implemented what we call a hybrid supervisor switches between the different controllers. So um, for vehicles, and again, this is an application-based result, it's not a general result. Uh, for vehicles, we can add, you can do this analysis and understand which model will do better or which models will do at least pretty okay in certain regions of the uh, operational um, profile. So for instance, here is a speed versus the steering angle. And as you can see on the diagram on the left, the, um, the dynamic model that's pretty well compared to what we call a high fidelity model implemented by this tool called CarSim. So the bottom trace in, in the screen is actually, I think I can use my mouse here. This bottom trace here is actually very low in error when we use the dynamic model, the six dimensional model. But as you can imagine, the kinematic model gets worse and pretty bad as the steering angle gets larger, okay? And as the velocity of a speed uh, of the car is, is larger, right? So uh, the kinematic model will do pretty well in this area, but in this area, we'll need to definitely use a dynamic model in order to get some sort of accuracy relative to a true high fidelity model, which has much higher dimension than six. So we can do that also in experiments. So my colleague Jonathan has actually a real vehicle and we did an experiments and we were able to reconstruct the same kind of situation and, and quantities. Now, in order to compute this scheme of control actions, what we use is what we call model predictive control. I will not get into a lot of details, but the idea of model predictive control is that if you give me your desired cost function, in other words, what you want to optimize, okay? Let's say, for instance, your, your goal is to, as I, I described for the quad rotor, is to get to this particular three-dimensional path. 
and, and, and navigate the quarter around that path. You can calculate essentially the error between your current position in 3D to the actual path position. And that error could be something like um, a square quantity. And then you can think that that square quantity should be minimized, right? And so that cost function, that distance to some extent, square if you will, to make it nice and smooth, would be your cost function for your optimization. So with a model of the system in discrete time, what you could do is to formulate the optimization problem that says over the next finitely many steps, you can tweak as many steps as you would like to have. That's what is called the prediction horizon here. In this case, it's denoted as P. Uh, for this next P step on your computations, I would like to make sure that the cost associated to my actions are essentially as low as possible. So the optimizer is going to try to find the sequence of inputs that give you a position trajectory that is as close as possible over that window of uh, steps of prediction horizon as you as you could to the desired 3D path for the particular quarter. Okay, so that will occur every so often, let's say maybe every step you recompute all that, or maybe every few steps you recompute all that, which is called the moving horizon um, for model predictive control. And what if you run that in the kinematic and dynamic models that I mentioned, the three dimensional and the, and the, and the six dimensional, for the three dimensional, as you see, the computation time is very, very much lower than the computation time for the dynamic model. Actually, there is almost like a 2.5 factor uh, difference, right? There are some situations where it takes longer, but this is essentially the uh, average here is pretty clear is in the neighborhood of um, 20 milliseconds for uh, kinematic and maybe in the range of 45 milliseconds for dynamic. And with that information, then you can actually use the uh, accuracy of the uh, models and say, well, if my vehicle is in the particular area of the state space, uh, I will use the kinematic model. I will solve a model predictive control problem with the kinematic model, while if it is in this other area, I will use the dynamic model and I will solve the dynamic uh, model predictive control problem, which would take longer, right? So I will pay the price for that. And that will give me essentially a guide on how to allocate resources, if that's the case uh, for your system. So here are some results where the vehicle is going from left to right, it's going to the star, which is our goal. And um, the idea is that the um, these circles here are obstacle. And as you could probably see, uh, the vehicle is essentially, initially is somewhat conservative. This is a dynamic model because there's quite a bit of maneuver to be done. Uh, but once the vehicle clears the obstacle right there and right there, and right there, it goes to the kinematic model. But when it's nearby the obstacles, it's using mostly the dynamic model, okay? And the time to solve here is 46 milliseconds, while here is 31 milliseconds in this particular snapshot. And uh, you can see that you have a significant reduction on computation time required for uh, getting that system to work. And you can run this in more complex environments, as you can see here, multiple vehicles, and multiple obstacles, excuse me, moving around. And uh, I believe this will be a nice, uh, a real simulation movie of this as the vehicle goes around. Uh, these arrows are as if the vehicle would be predict the possible direction. It doesn't really predict because it's also an optimization problem, but for visualizations, we look at all the possibilities forward in time. If you look at the effect, of computing and the cost of doing these computations for the model predictive control schemes. If you use just a kinematic, you get this quantity, this amount about this cost of computing. If you do the dynamic, you get this one. And if you do the switching scheme, you reduce and you get kind of the best of both worlds for the system. So this is one particular approach. It doesn't involve a lot of the resource um, allocation schemes that I was telling you that it will be important, but it kind of uh, sets a stage for future developments, which in my opinion brings to a number of great opportunities that are you know, of interest, not only to me, but maybe to some of you, and I will be happy to engage and discuss many of these. Uh, one of them is how to effectively characterize the computation time of a, part of a particular control algorithm. 
can we do more of a rigorous analysis on how much this will take in a particular computer system, or do we also just need to uh, re use uh, numerics or, or simulations with hardware in the loop? What are the best ways to go about these um, characterizations? I think also there's a great opportunity here to design the platform so that actually the platform meets the design specifications and is somewhat uh, prepared for the design of the algorithm as well. So what I mean is a co-design of physics, computing, and algorithms all together. So I want to leave you with that. I want to say that this area is so exciting to me that Two years ago, we wrote this large proposal to the National Science Foundation to design a physical system uh, solicitation, and we were awarded um, July last year, 2022, this frontier project with many of my collaborators, Murad Archak from UC Berkeley, Lynn Fan, I already mentioned from UPenn, Jonathan Sprinkle also mentioned from Vanderbilt University, Majid Samani from University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Abhishek Halder from UC Santa Cruz and Heiner Litz also from UC Santa Cruz uh, to work on this particular problem of how to design not only the computing but also the physics to be aware of the computations. And the intention is that we, we can now design both the software and the hardware together. That's the intention. We just started the project six months ago. And we have a number of partners that you see right here on the screen, academic and industry partners. And I very excited about maybe in a few years, I will leave more than a couple, to come back with some solutions to this question that are more holistic than the solutions that I've been seeing in the literature and you build from and improve from the ones that I was advocating for. So with that being said, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming during your lunchtime and happy to answer any questions here. The links to my website and also to the uh, new project, the Frontier project, if you're interested. Great, Ricardo, we have one question from the audience uh, in the q and I I don't know if, if you can read that or I can read it out to you. Thank you, Michael. So the question is the Silicon Valley startup Grok has developed processing architecture to compete with Tensor that makes the cheap performance deterministic wooden are deterministic competition time improve adaptive? Absolutely, uh, thanks David for that comment. If we have a way to, I mean, the deterministic will be probably too much to ask for, but a, you know, a rather good grasp on how long it takes to compute for these algorithms, that will be extremely viable. Looking forward to talking to you more. And anyone else with a question? Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, he's added a comment. Okay. Look, look forward to read. Seriously, deterministic. Yeah. Wow, very impressive. Will you please email me? So while we're waiting for other questions, Ricardo, I know you mentioned early on in the talk that um, one of the challenges with the computing intensive environment that we're living in now is the effect on the environment. And you mentioned that one of our challenges is really how can we make um, our approach to computing greener and more environmentally friendly? And it, could you talk a little more about that? Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. I think that's that's a you know that's a great question. That's a you know not only for autonomous cars, but very importantly for aviation is how to make this um, this cleaner. Here's a, a chart that I had I didn't get to show you, but um, down here. Um, this is an image from the University of Michigan. This is the essentially the, uh, the amount of energy consumed for a fourth fusion autonomous system. And if you look at the computer part, it's 41%. Everything else is certainly adding to it, but it's significant. So the amount of power used for computing, for algorithms, for perception in particular, and for decision making, and for networking is, is, is major. So, you know, as these vehicles are now more fully electric, the question is, is, is electric power the right way to power these systems as they're requiring more and more energy? 
I don't have an answer for you to that, but there are, you know, new and exciting ways that we can probably, emerging exciting ways that we could probably use to um, power these systems that will be really less of an impact in the environment. So that, you know, that aspect should also be part of the system design, right? Uh, the environmental aspects, and again, not just, as I said, safety, uh, comfort, um, cost, it should also be a factor in, again, in the in the massive cost function of system design, uh, environmental effect and impact should be put there. 